I, I want, to, I want to, today to share with you, I'm so excited to speak in front of live crowd uh, as opposed to virtually as we're doing every week to hundred, thousands of people worldwide uh, because we are in time that we need this connection. More than any other time we need this, this connection and today I uh, have prepared a very important, very special message for you called Shemen Le Maor. This is a message that I believe that God has ordained specifically for Fresno, California. You know, as, uh, as you talked about this, you talk about it quite, quite a bit. Uh, there has been so much resistance from coming here from so many different places. It's, it was like yesterday I'm really starting to doubt, doubt myself whether or not I should actually be or not. So, but then the Lord spoke to me very powerfully. I was sitting and I, you know, I, w I got the lucky one. I got the middle seat, you know, that's, that's a good one. In the very, very last row on, <laughs> on Embraer 175, which is one of those tiny planes. Good times, good time. And it's funny when God's speaking to you, I'm sitting there, I'm typing like that. I'm typing my message, I'm like that. That's all the space I have to type, you know, it's like, I'm being sandwiched mm -hmm. like this and right there in the middle of all the bumpiness between uh, Bakersfield uh, to Fresno to, to Phoenix. Uh, I, I, get, I, I get the revelation from God that, that I want to share with you today uh, in this time. This uh, particular Torah portion that we are going to be speaking about today is important because we are reading about the building of a Mishkan. Now I want you to pay attention to something when talking about Mishkan. When we are talking about the Mishkan, what do you hear? What word do you hear? You hear the word Shekinah. Inside the word Mishkan, we have the word Shekinah. Now, the word Mishkan is an interesting word. It's a funny word in Hebrew. The word Mishkan is rooted, as, as you probably know, every Hebrew, every Hebrew word have three root letters. The word Mishkan comes from the word Shechen. Shechen actually means a neighbor. But not a neighbor that is far, a neighbor that is very, very close. A neighbor that lives with you, a neighbor that is live with you. So this, who do you think the neighbor that we're talking about here today? It's God himself. We're talking about the, mish, the Shachen, the one that wants to tabernacle is God himself. Now, I want you to notice something though about God and, 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 and about the Mishkan. The Mishkan have different names. Rabbi Sophie Israel teaches the Mishkan have another name. And the first name that the Mishkan that is used in context is called the Ark, like Noah Ark. The second name for the Mishkan is the Sukkah that Abraham has built in Genesis chapter 12 when he brought in the Gentiles. Remember, he brought in them. It's also called a Mishkan. It's, it's called by different names. The third name that is called is a tabernacle. And the fourth name that is called is the temple. Okay? So all of those things serve as the same purpose, it, they represent a blueprint, a blueprint for what God wants in the world. And, and if you want to make yourself a note, what God agenda in this world, what God agenda is this, build me a house that I will tabernacle inside of you. God have only one agenda, not to be the noisy neighbor down the street, but to be a neighbor that live right next to you. God have no other agenda, but we have a problem. In order for God to tabernacle with us, how many of you know that God is holy? Everything about God is holy. Can something holy tabernacle with something that is not holy? It's impossible, right? So the question is not how we build, build a tabernacle, but how do we build a tabernacle that is acceptable for God to dwell in? How, what makes you acceptable to God? What makes you, uh, uh, Stacy, acceptable? What makes any of us acceptable to God? And what makes a synagogue a place of worship? What makes a place of worship acceptable for God? We know the end result. The end result is the Shekinah is dwelling in this place. But you ever ask yourself a question? When you founded the synagogue here, what is going to make it acceptable?
acceptable for the Ruach to come and to dwell in? This is going to be an important question for all of us to ask. What makes something acceptable for God to come and tabernacle in? This is exactly what I want to look with you at today. Because you see, if you take this word tabernacle, and you, it's the word mikdash, what you heard, you heard the word kadosh, and you remove the kuf, and you flip the letter, you get the word shemit, destruction. In essence, if you build a house, or if I can be even more personal, if we can build a synagogue or a church or a community, and it doesn't follow God's blueprint, not only that it will not be successful, it will bring a destruction. And I hate to say it, there's a lot of destruction here in Fresno, California. You know why? Because it's not following the blueprint of God. You need to pay attention to this today because God has spoken to me specifically about this today. Let's go together to the beginning, to the beginning of the Torah portion and read together. I put all the passages for you on the screen. He says, speak to the children of Israel or tell the children of Israel. You can see it with me. Tell to the children of Israelites to bring me gifts. You shall accept gifts for me from every person who art so move on. Now you have to understand there is something really weird about this here. It says in one essence God is saying, oh my goodness, give me the gift, right? It's a free will. Give me the gift. Give me this. But then he says the gift that will be taken. Wait a second. If it is something that is will be given free will, why God uses this type of language of to take something? Have you ever stopped to think about that? There's a reason behind it, and I want to look specifically at the reason behind this. This word is important word. Here in the text, it's used the word so hard, move him. Let me tell you something. First and foremost, building God a house is a question of the heart. It's not a question of the mind. You ask me all the time the question, how do we go? I'm telling you, I am... I am every week somewhere else and people ask me, how do you, you do something only if you love the one who sent you to do it. If you do it on your own purpose, on your own power, eventually you will run dry. And there is sometimes that it's going to be hard building a synagogue, building a community, being a congregation. And that's when you need to step back and ask the question, God, why? Because there's a bigger picture. You're preparing a place for God to tabernacle with men. Now, in order to do this, you have to have the ingredients, right? You, 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 you cannot just come and say, hey, God, I woke up by the Holy Spirit, and I am going to build a house the way I want it. Remember in the book of Deuteronomy, what he said to Israel? He said to me, I picked the place. I pick, I pick, somebody talked about Leviticus 23 earlier, I think you lady, and you said, oh, I shared, why is it important? Why Leviticus 23 is so important? It's important because there is time, there are seasons, right? And here in the Torah, you're reading all about the raw materials that have to be taking place. And it's very particular. It's very, very difficult. Now, you have to understand something about those, those, those materials. There are exactly 13 different principles, 13 articles that are, are going to be used here to build the, the tabernacle. Okay? Those represent, those 13 things, by the way, the 13 things, remember when Moses prayed, Adonai, Adonai, El Rechum, Bechanun. There are 13 articles of mercy. But they're work, they're physical things. He's talking about the stones for the bread, breastplate. He's talking about the clothing for Aaron the high priest. Those are practical things. And I want you to explain to you something. It's those 13 things that are required for Mishkan are representing your work. They're representing your avodah. They're representing the labor. When we build a house for God, it's going to take work. You saw today, no, chanting from the Torah, I'm sitting here, you know, I'm chilling because I know that the kid can handle it. As a matter of fact, he wanted to go crazy, he wanted to do the entire shacharit for you today. I had to hold him back. 
you know what? It's a result of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing. Wow, your kid is so that he is talented, but he put the work to build a house, to build a synagogue, going to take work. I was so delighted to hear the report this, morning, this afternoon about an art coming. It's required work. You want to make things excellent? It's going to take work. This week the rabbits in Chico not even fill their hand. We sent thousand orders of the Rivka remnant. And every time I wanted to turn the manuscript, she said, no, there is more in you. I said, there's nothing more in me. <laughs> there's nothing more. You squeeze me like a lemon. Stop. <laughs> she look at me. She doesn't even speak. Now we're in this level of the relationship. You don't even speak. It's this look. <laughs> the eyes of the woman. There is more. And you go to bed stewing in your juices. What more there is in me? Lord, help me. I'm famished. <laughs> you need to be around people like that. Mm -hmm. Not the people who are going to be squeezing you to condemn you, but people who believe that there is greatness in you and going to make you rise up to the top. This is the people you need to be surrounded by. Yeah. Sometimes we're surrounded by people to just squeeze us, squeeze us. But they squeeze us for the wrong purpose. And here Israel is being squeezed. Did you look at all the details of the Mishkan? He wants us to bring this stone and that thing and that. You read from verse 1 to verse 8, you get a headache. Mm -hmm. Have you ever stopped and asking yourself a question? Where are they? Where are they? Oh, yeah, they're in downtown Fresno. I get it. <laughs> no, they're not in downtown Fresno. They're in the wilderness for Pete's sakes. And in the middle of the wilderness, they need to, to, to bring these uh, this topaz stones. Some of those items I never even heard about. Ram skin, dolphin skin. Where will you find a dolphin skin in the middle of the wilderness? <laughs> Hello? Goat out, crimson, yes? Blue and purple? Are you kidding me? Some of you are like this today, well, I'm in Fresno, I can't do all those things. I am in the middle of a desert. I'm in the middle of a place that cannot be provided. It can be provided. God provided in the wilderness more miracles than he provided in any other places. Check me out. Go to the book of Numbers. There are more miracles in the book of Numbers than any other book in the Bible. Why? Because God loved to provide when we depend upon Him. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to do the work. Amen. They do have to do the work. That's one thing I love about us, our organization. People ask me, what's your job? I say, my job is to be a worker. What do you do? I work. What do you do on Shabbat? I work. When do you rest, Rabbi? Thanks God for the Christian for Sunday. I rest on a Sunday. Preferably before the church crowd came out. You know what I'm talking about, 11, 11.30? It's going to become chaotic after that, right? We work. And here the text is clear. Now I want you to notice something. You can work and work and work and work and it's not going to be enough. There's a surprise here in the text. Listen to what the rabbis tell us. And we have the next slide already. Yeah, that's perfect. It says 13 different items. Listen to, the, to what our rabbis tell us. 13 different items were required. And I want you to establish, to underline this word, required to establish the tabernacle for Two things for two, two, two purposes for the clothing or for the clothing of the priest that had to be done meticulously. And I want you to underline this word meticulously. There is no shortcuts in building a Mishkan. There is no shortcut in building a synagogue. There is no shortcut in building the kingdom of God. 
Really, the Mishkan is a picture of the kingdom. What we're talking about here is establishing the kingdom. And I love this word of Yeshua. He said, if somebody come and tell you the, the kingdom is here or there, don't believe him. Lie. Because they're calling you with the get, get rich scheme quickly. It does not exist. There is no shortcuts in establishing the kingdom of God. People of God, you need to hear it today. But I have good news for you. What if, if I have those, it's like a road, and it's like, you know, you drive from Bakersfield to here. <laughs> That's a weird drive. Yeah. I told my wife, if you don't find me the Starbucks <laughs> on the way, we're going to have some problems. <laughs> so Noah pulled the line and said, there's this town, 700 people. Maybe they have Starbucks. I'm like, no, they're not going to have Starbucks, Noah. And then we find Chester Chicken. Oh. Chester Chicken. All over the place. All over the place. Thank you, Noah. That's not Starbucks either. <laughs> and then we pass all those places. I don't know. I see the fume and like, what the heck are they doing here? It's not a scenic sight. You go through step one, step two, step... This is like those 13 steps, okay? Before you get to the Geula, I saw down the street. I saw the Starbucks here, down the, the street. But you have to go through those steps. One, two, three. Now, what if I tell you... What if I tell you that you can go on a very fast boat through step one to 13? Would you take it? Would you take it? If it's Hashem's word. That's not the right answer. <laughs> that is what we call Sabbath words. <laughs> there you go. We have one honest Jew in the house. Thank you. <laughs> of course you're going to take it. If I tell you, you can get to Fresno in 15 minutes, then go the scenic way for, for the two hours to bake. Of course you'll take it. I have good news for you. I have really good news to you. Listen to this. There are two items that are hidden in the text. There are not 13 items, but there are 15 items that are needed for the Mishkan. And those two additional items that are needed for the Mishkan are make the other 13 just, just basically come to their fullness just like that. As a matter of fact, if you don't have those two, the other 13s mean nothing. You can do all the work you want. But listen to what our rabbis say to us, and we'll see it in the text. He says, and I quote, however, however, I want you to underline it, there are 15 different items that were used it is important to note and i want you to put a big underline of the two hidden items that are needed to establish the mishkan the first one is oil for the lighting and spices for the anointing oil are, are, are out of the ordinary there are two items the rabbis of israel telling us that are out of the ordinary meaning they are not they are not connected you see each each one of the 13 things have one or two purpose they're either to the building of the mishkan or to the clothing of the high priest okay each one of the 13 prince, uh, uh, items but there are two items that are neither they are not for the high priest and they are not for the establishing of the Mishkan. And you need to ask yourself the question, what are those two items and what they are here? Let's see what the text says. What are them? Look at Exodus 25, 6. It says, oil for lighting spices and for the anointing oil and for the aromatic incense. You know, I was always thinking, my wife always liked this aromatic incense in, our, in the house, like to make it smell nice. Essential oil. Yeah, I was thinking it's kind of like essential oil. Mm, I see God need an essential oil in this house. Does that make sense? Not to me. God does not need an essential oil. Excuse me. God brings the essential oil. He doesn't need the essential oil. The 
question that you have to ask yourself is if those Teatin articles that used for the Mishkan or for the priest are required to build the house and also to dress the high priest. And of course we know the high priest is a picture of Mashiach. Mashiach needs to be dressed by us. It is, not, it is not he who dressed us, it is we who dressed him. Notice how Aaron become holy. He says the people made Aaron holy by clothing him properly with his bread, breastplate. Oops, I forgot one stone of the breastplate. The rabbis asked the question, what would happen if somebody made a mistake? And, and instead of 12 stones, put 11 stones. They say, if he would have walked into the Holy of Holies, he would have died on the spot. It is us who dress Yeshua, friends. It is us representing Yeshua today. And the way we choose to dress him he is important because that is the purpose. In his Jewish clothing rather, rather than the clothing of Rome. Okay, so that's one thing. Then we can build him a beautiful synagogue. Oh my goodness, Brent, you're going to get here. A beautiful ark. That means that the Holy Spirit will appear here immediately. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. I have been in some synagogues, the most beautiful synagogues that you can imagine, and there is no spirit there. The Shekinah is not there. And sometimes I've been in the rooms like this, 14 by 14, 16 by 16, where the spirit is moving. What is the difference? The difference is what the Torah is speaking about. Make yourself a note. Oil and spices. Oil and spices. Now let me explain to you this. What is this? Why those two items are so critical? Our Rabbi Hiskuni explained the following for us and I quote, Since it is not customary for a king to enter a palace until the palace is complete and its furniture are in place as well as illumination have been lit. This is mentioned already here. The same oil was also used for anointing oil for a sacred vessel. Do you hear what the purpose of the oil is? The purpose of the oil is to welcome the king. The reason that we're talking about oil and anointing oil in general, brothers and sisters, it is a oil for a king. And if there is a king, it means that there is a kingdom. Amen. If we're building any house, brothers and sisters, if we build any house, and it is not the house of the king, but rather our own home, watch what is happening. It's going to be destroyed. Who does the synagogue belong to? The synagogue doesn't belong to Brent and Stacy. They're just caretakers. Who is Avada Me Ministries belong to? Avada Me Ministries does not belong to Rabbi Shapiro. He just allow me to start it, but it belongs to him. We need to be careful about this because what the rabbis explained to us today that it is a king cannot enter until the palace is complete. Oil represent a house that is complete. And every day, every, every day I'm looking at our, our ministry and I said, wow, well, this is not perfect and this is not perfect and this is not excellent and we can improve on that and that should be your mode. Don't get to the mode of stagnant and say, I'm going to continue to do the same thing the same way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you talk about the post office. Mm -hmm. We had an innovation with the post office. Yeah. Yeah. Look for those innovations. Look for new things. Look for a breakthrough. Every Shabbat should be different from the Shabbat before that. Yeah. We should not be in a stagnant mode that it's the same again and again and again. The foundation of building the, the king house have three principles that I want you to think about. Next slide. Here we go. Number one, the Mishkan, write yourself the note. The Mishkan represents the house of the king, which is called the kingdom. What are we building here? 
What does the Mishkan represent? It represents the kingdom. When you walk in through this door, no matter, no matter it's double door or single door, no matter how many people are here, you are entering into the house of the king. Let me ask you a question. Will our demeanor will be different if we know that Yeshua is sitting right there on this seat as a king? I promise you it's going to be different for each and every one of us. Let me tell you, he is here. And he is watching whether or not this becomes his kingdom or somebody else's kingdom. Number two, we're learning so far, the king will not enter the house until the house is complete. This is really important for all of us to understand. He is not going to come to some broken, broken, broken house. Today, most of the Jewish Christian world look at us and say, I can't wait to get the heck out of this world. God rapture me. Just take me out of it. You see how different Judaism from Christianity is? Judaism says, put me in, coach. This is the time to kumiori, arise and shine. This is the time to build the remnants. Not to escape, but build it. And think about it. Do you think it's Yeshua? How many of you believe he's coming back as king? Do you think he's going to come to some broken kingdom? Are you kidding me? You have to come to a place that has a kingdom already. Kingdom have to be prepared for him. And this kingdom is being prepared to invite the remnant. So today, your job is to complete the task that God has given you. If God has given you the task of having a messianic synagogue in Fresno, California, you need to get behind the work that is being done here. And I love it. There was not one person who did not work. Everybody is working. I remember sometimes ago somebody come to me and said, well, you know how it is. 80%, 20% of the people doing the 80% of the work. Let me tell you something. This is not the standard of the kingdom. Look at this. Moses did not have to twist arms or force. It was a heart issue and every person came and served. If you are a member of the kingdom, you have the responsibilities of the kingdom, brothers and sisters. And number three, building the kingdom, including dressing the priest. It's one thing to establish a beautiful mishkan. You know, you can build a beautiful mishkan. Don't lose a purpose of what we are called to do also, to dress Yeshua. This is your purpose. And who should you be reaching to? The Jewish community? And even more importantly, it's step one, in my opinion, to the Christian community. Yes. Because when the Christians start to undress him and redress him, then there is a greater testimony to the Jewish moral, honestly. There's not even place to talk to the Jewish world today about this because the Christian dressed him in so many different clothes that have to be completely stripped out. And sadly, even Messianic Judaism today continue to dress him with the wrong clothes and with the wrong gloves. You see, he is giving an oil. Look what his kuni said. I continue, he says, and I quote, kings are in the habit of providing their palaces with aromatic fragrances. You remember, you talk about those things. Before, I wanted to underline this word, before they take up residence in them. Excuse me? Do we want him to come and tabernacle with us? Well, before that, they have to have the aroma of the kingdom. If there's no aroma of the kingdom, he's not going to come and dwell there. This house is being established for crying out loud in the wilderness. Don't look for God to do something when, when he comes. That's too late. Now is the time. Now is the opportunity. You talk about how hard it is in California, Brent. You know what? It's hard. That means that the opportunity is greater. I know everybody lives in California, but for crying out loud, somebody needs to stay in California and win California. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it's true. Having a beautiful facility, having the stones, having the arcs, having the house built without the oil without the spirit that will allow God to tabernacle with the king is like an empty house. 
You don't want an empty house. And you can have a house full of people. And it's still empty if God is not in it. Stop worrying about the number game and how many people are here and how many people are not here. Not important, not relevant. Just make sure you get 10 men and you're in good shape. That's all what is needed. Oh, this week we had 37 and this week 51. Oh. No. God says that the most important thing is to have the environment, the spiritual environment that God can tabernacle with us. So what is the two most important things that we can bring? It is the, the, the oil, the oil. Let me hold on a second, let me get water. I'm not used to speaking, as you can tell, my voice. Oh, no, how's my voice sounding? Pretty good. Thank you. You can always tell me the truth. I'll give it a, I'll give it a seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. <laughs> you want honesty, you always ask your son. <laughs> but both of these items, listen to me. The oil and the spice, spices have a purpose. And the purpose is to cultivate an environment for the Messiah to dwell. Both of those items, oil and spices, are spiritual items. And here the house has to be light. That's why I ask you the question today. Who is going to light this house? Is it God or is it man? I hope that you see and understand that it is you and I who light the house that's going to be belong to him. That is not the job of God. That is the job of each and every one of you. And these spices are so important. Why are those spices were all so important? Listen to that. Get ready to be shocked by it. It says this. It is somewhat puzzling. Why is the verse has been inserted there? Listen, go to the next slide. Sorry. Here we go. Is it somewhat puzzling? Why is this verse being inserted here? Seeing that the entire chapter deals with materials, history, building, tabernacle, with the exception of this item. Although the requirement for the table in the tabernacle has not been mentioned here, although that would have, have been appropriate if that the Torah had wished to mention the requirement of the menorah, the lampstand, also the fire one and the altar should have been mentioned. And why the animals were needed to be offered on the altar? Why was the oil singled out? This is the question that you have to ask yourself. Why was the oil singled out? Look at the answer. Next slide. It says, in the king palace, in our physical universe, now pay attention closely, before the king enters, enters it with its view to take up his residence. So prior when God is entering in, different pleasant smelling spices are scattered, scattered to dissipate, dissipate remnants of unpleasant others that been accumulated during the time of construction. It is clear, therefore, that no less would have been done to structure houses that presence of the Shekinah, presence of the Creator would have been made ready for His occupancy. We find that indeed that the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle was made possible only through the presence of the incense. In essence, sometimes we are going through a process of building and building and building. And we need to be careful from that. We're building our own kingdoms. We're building our own territories. We are building our own ministries. And you know what happened here? You know what is California is known for? Environmental pollution. What is the text telling us is that you can build a house and you can generate a spiritual environmental pollution. We call it toxicity. Yes. 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 And I need to tell you something. You can build a wonderful ministry and still have a very toxic ministry. Are you worried about what I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. There is something that the Torah is telling us. The purpose of the incense was to cleanse the house 
spiritually from the toxicity before inviting the Shekinah to come to dwell with this. And don't make a, any mistake. What is this all represent? Here Rabbi Nubachia is telling us in the next verse. The word oil for lance lightning is a reference to King Messiah. Of whom it is written in Psalm 132, 17. There I will make a home sprout to David. I have prepared a lamp for what? For my anointed one. Are we building today this house in a way that is going to generate toxicity or in the way that is going to have the fragrance of the Messiah? I have to tell you something. A lot of times when we look at this, look at your city. You have a toxic situation in your own city, in the body of the Messiah. It is true. And it's not something that is so unique, I have to say it. It's something that is very, very common in the body of Messiah. It's sad. Because guess what? God cannot and God will not dwell in a house when there is this toxic smell, this toxic aroma. And you need to make sure that at each of every one of you go. The Mishkan is a picture of you as an individual, a picture of your family, a picture of your community. It's all of the above. Number one, I said, you make sure that you don't turn to be a toxic individual. You hear what I'm telling you? I don't know why it is, but I have a pretty good sample. I've been in almost 50 countries. And most of the time meeting messianic, they are the most toxic people on the face of the earth. Prideful, arrogant, venom. You pick the word. Do you think that is a reflection of the brick that is going to go to the house of God? Or those who are going and building a messianic ministry where they're the best and everybody else is lower. Everybody is beneath them. That do you think how the kingdom of God is being going to be built? Brothers and sisters, you know, I've been even threatened not to come to your city. It is sad. It is sad that some people who could not come here today because they're threatened. Do you think that this is the spirit of the living God? Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want you to tell you and leave you today with this question about the spices and the oil. And here is this question, next slide. Are we building a house for ourselves or are we building a house for the king of kings. This is the million dollar question. This is the question that each and every one of you have to ask today. Are you building a house for yourself? Or are you building the house of Mashiach? Is your ministry, is your life, and don't say you're not, you are in ministry because you're a part of building this Mishkan. You're a picture. You're the prototype of the, is it built for you? Or is it going to be built for everybody around you, mainly the house of Israel and King Messiah? That's the question. I would like to give you five principles of preparing to what the Torah calls Shemen Lemaor. Shemen Lemaor, a oil for light. I'm going to give you five principles of establishing healthy and vibrant messianic house that establish and ready to receive the Shikan, the Mishkan. Number one, that's what we learned today. Number one, the removal of unpleasant fragrances. What we learned from the Torah today? We learned that any place that there is an un, like a stink bomb. Have you ever been in a place that there's a stink bomb? Don't be in a place that have a spiritual stink bombs. I'm going to tell you that much, okay? Construction, here is a kingdom principle for today. Construction that cause bad smell is not a construction of the house of God. You hear what I'm telling you? 
a construction that brings a bad testimony, a construction that causes pain, a construction that causes hate, is not a construction with God and for God. Be careful. You might reach your end goal and build your kingdom, but in the process, how many good stones? How many good stones are you going to let go and leave them the debris and rubble to stink and rot? I tell you this from experience as a rabbi. There are so many times that I didn't see the potential in some people who came to roam me and I say, I forget it. Don't give up on any stone. Because the moment the stone is thrown away, it starts to rot. And your ministry Building the Mishkan is about the people. That's why, you know, there's, there's this argument here between Maimonides and Nachmanides. Was the house, listen to the, the question that they were arguing about, Maimonides and Nachmanides. Maimonides says that the essence was the building of the house. Nachmanides says that the essence was the Shekinah. Which one was the essence? Do you know that each one of these 13 different things represent different type of sin? What, do you think God really need a house? God doesn't need a house. It was about refining the bricks, refining the stones. The entire building activity here is about the people. It's about you and I. Mm -hmm. Refining ourselves. Mm -hmm. Number two, actually, yeah, let's go to number two. This is important. Number two, checking the smell of the builders who build the house. This is important. People of God, you are to hold your leaders accountable. We have to hold one another accountable. Because if one of us is a builder and another one is a builder, and we don't build in the same standard, what kind of house do you think we are going to hand up with? That's why in my house I just don't build. But the rabbits in build. Much better. If we do it together, it's going to be messed up, you know. There is a standard to building. And the standard of building have a name. It's called the Torah. The minute you go outside Torah, you have no standard because they say, well, you have the standard and I have a standard. And everything becomes rele relevant. Yeah, relevant. Yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? Relative. 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 Thank you. It's become relative. And the one thing God said to Israel, don't do things according to your own eyes. You're giving you a standard. You have to understand one of the purposes of the Torah is not just to tell us to do or don't, but to help us to measure one another or hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I must tell you, even the way some of the things that happened here with this community that, that was happening with the, like MJA and stuff like that, not according to God's standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not according to Torah. You have to hold your, your leaders to this standard. That's why Rashi says the following. Listen, this is the greatest Jewish commentator. And he says this. In context to Leviticus 26, he says, One will stumble by reason of the sin of another. This is amazing. What caused one person to sin? His own sin? No. Somebody else sin. He's taking sense of or account of other. For all of Israel, I want you to write down this sentence. All of Jewish Torah between love your neighbor and yourself is based upon this statement. For all of Israel are holding responsible or accountable for one another. Israel is holding one another accountable. Brothers and sisters, you are to hold one another accountable. One thing I like about your community associated with, with, with us, we are holding you guys accountable. You're holding us accountable. There's accountability. You don't do whatever you feel like doing. 
brothers and sisters, this is important because otherwise the smell from the building will rot the entire house. There's a wonderful story in the Talmud about this, about a man, two men going to the bottom of the ship and they both go to sleep. And as they go to sleep, I don't know if you ever heard this story, if the man wake up, the one man once says, and he heard the sound. And like, what is this weird sound? So we go to the cell next to him, and he sees his friend making a hole at the bottom of the ship. As water just squirting in, squirting in, he says to him, what are you doing? As water just coming in, he said, we're all going to die now. <laughs> because water come in, this ship slowly, slowly, slowly starts sinking. And he answered to him and he says to him, don't worry, it's going to affect only my cell. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a real story in the Talmud. You see the problem? The way you build affects somebody else. The way your community handled itself going to affect who else? Dr. Amnon Shaw, Costa, it's going to affect them. We are connected because there are no five houses. There is one house. There is one house. Not two houses, there's one house of Israel. Praise be to God. Hold each other accountable. Number three. Preparing for the lighting or the lighting of the house. To write yourself this, number three, checking your oil pressure. What do I mean by this? I want you to write yourself this note. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here you go. Checking your oil pressure. The Torah is called the light as well as the mitzvot. This is important. I want you to pay attention to something I want to quote directly from the Rivka remnant for a moment, directly from the parable of Yeshua in Matthew 25. Next slide, page 137. It said, the five virgin who carried the oil into their lamps were successful in their journey to meet the groom just like Rivka. The remnant will be successful in their journey as it's prompt out to the groom to come out. I want you to ask yourself the question, what caused the other five to run out of oil. What caused them to run out of oil? What the oil represent? The oil represent the mitzvot. They all represent Torah. Listen to this next like Proverbs 623 says and I quote, for the mitzvah is a lamp. Torah is light and reproof that Discipline are the way of life. You know what caused them to run out of the light, of the oil? The fact that they're not doing enough mitzvot. Today, if you really want to fail, focus on yourself. If you want to go further, focus on what you, what you want and what you can do in the world around yourself. Any person who will become self-consumed in the days ahead will not be able to overcome the trivials of the Messiah. Will not be an effective builder. Why? Because he's just worried about his own little brick, his own little universe. But this is about the God house. This is about God universe. This is about God kingdom, not your own. Brothers and sisters, the five virgins ran out of oil because they were not practicing Torah. Today your job is to focus on Torah and mitzvot that benefit the community. I want to stress to you again, Torah is about community. Mitzvot is about community, not about salvation, about community. What am I going to bring to the house? What others will gain from me? This is the question that we ask to ask ourselves today. Check your old pressure, not just the quantity, but the quality. Number four, as we're ready to, to light the house, and remember again, if the house is not lit, Yeshua is not coming. We learn it today. The king is not coming to any house unless the light, the house is lit. Number four, remember, we still have to deal with the spices. 
Microsoft the note. Number four, this is a, such a fundamental principle, kingdom. Next slide, it says here's principle number four. Check the aroma in the house. And I want you to ask yourself the question, how is the rest of the Jewish world, and by the way, not just the Jewish world, the Christian world, mm -hmm. how do they perceive us? Do they perceive us as adversarial, as the one that just like a sting bomb? Then guess what? If they, they perceive us like that, we're not building the house because it's, it's a bad aroma again. It's a bad testimony. Look at, listen to what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 2. He says, but thanks be to God. Next slide. But thanks be to God, who is the Messiah, consistently lead us in a triumphal procession. And through us spread everywhere in the fragrance. Here you go. We talk about the spread spices. The fragrance of what it means to know him. For to God we are the aroma of the Mashiach both among those being saved and those being lost. For to that letter, we are to smell of death, leading only to more death. But to the former, we are sweet smell of life, leading to more life. Who is equal to such a task? In essence, you know, your house is going to smell in one or two ways. It's going to either smell like life and blessing or curses or debt. And I want to ask a question today. What people smell when they come to your house? When they look upon your life? They say, wow, I want to run away from this person like a plague. Or do they say, I want to be next to this person because I smell the life of the house of God inside of them. Today, we, we have to be careful the way we're being perceived in the world. We need to pray for unity here, reconciliations to take place, all of those things to come together in order to receive a good testimony. It says on the believers in the book of Acts, he said they had a good testimony in the house of Israel. Messianic Judaism does not have a good testimony today. It doesn't look very good to us when we see negative reports. Like what happened in Capitol Hill with Messianic Judaism. It's sad. We need to be careful. The way we live our life, brothers and sisters. Which lead me to the ultimate one. Number five. <coughs> Examine the quality of our oil. What is the quality of your mitzvot? Is it, this is the million dollar question today, is it enough to light up the house? Is there enough oil today in me to light up? Is there enough merit in my practicing of the Torah? Of the, is there enough of me to light the world around me? To light the house around. That is the ultimate question we have to ask ourselves. And you see, uh, that's a test. And I hope you understand right now, you're being tested. We are being tested. The book of Romans says, the book of Romans says that even the believers, brothers and sisters, even the believers are going to be tested in the last days. Are you hearing what I'm telling you here? In the Rivka Remnant, a book that I really recommend that you all read, we read this very strange verse as Rivka is coming to Yitzchak. I want you to listen to this, to the conclusion of Rivka coming to Yitzchak. And it says, next slide, it says, Then Yitzchak brought her to the tent of Sarah, his mother. Did you stop and ask yourself the question? Why on earth he took her to the tent of his mother, Sarah? Jewish tradition teaches us that inside the tent of Sarah, there was always a light because the Shekinah was there. Notice he's not marrying her. He's not marrying her at all. He is testing her. 
the Mulubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Schnitzer, Schnitzer is telling us this, the following slide, he says, because of her virtues, because of the quality of her oil, Rivka was fit to become Yitzchak's wife, even so, Yitzchak was not entirely certain that Rivka, I want you to underline those words, this is straight from Rivka Remnant, Yitzchak was not entirely certain that Rivka quality, quali qualities resemble those of her family, particularly the righteousness of her mother, Sarah. You know when he decided to marry her? He brought her inside the tent. The Jewish tradition teaches that when Rivka walked in, the light came on. Why is it? Because she had the quality of the oil. Today, your job is not just to fulfill a mitzvot and running around like, like you know, look at 630 mitzvot, say, I can do that, I can do it. It's not just a game of yeses or noes. That's called legalism. Mm -hmm. It is about the quality. What's go inside of you is going to come outside of you. If you put the cheapest and lid it, well, th that's a joke. There's no cheapest in California. You know? <laughs> if you put the 423, <laughs> never mind, you didn't. We in Texas were privileged with that yes. one, right? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Let, me. let me, because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you for a second. If you put your religious practice, if you put your religious practice before focus on the quality of understanding, then you are not going to be able to present all the ultimate oil that is needed to light the house. Why do we have a yeshiva? Why do we teach? It's not because the what is to put it upon our heart so that we understand. So Rivka is going through this journey. And by the way, she never met Yitzchak. Rivka is like a complete Gentile coming from this terrible home, a broken home, where his own, uh, own brother is called Satan. His name in Hebrew is Satan. The brother of Satan is bringing salvation to the house of Israel. Today, uh, what you're going to bring the house of Israel does not depend on what was given to you. Brothers and sisters, it does not depend on your lineage. It's depend on the one who is feeling you. Excuse me. The one who is feeling you and what you're willing to be poor out. I want to pray for those five things because I'm telling you something. The house has to be lit today. It starts with your own life, then your community, and then ultimately the salvation of the entire house of Israel. And you need those two ingredients today more than anything else because the world today, I hate to use this language, stinks. Yes. Can we say the world really stinks? Yes. So how do we move this stinky smell? Holding each other accountable. We're doing this today by understanding we're not doing something for us. As Paul says in the book of Hebrews, we're not building a house for now. We're building it to city to come, a house to come. What will I gain from this? I might gain nothing. But I will have something to pass to the next generation. I will have something to pass to my children and my grandchildren. We have to check the smell. Each and every one of us have to be brutally honest with us. If we are called to be like a Rivka remnant, to be this remnant, we have to be brutally honest with us. I love this because Rivka did not talk a lot. She did a lot. Matter of fact, I asked her one question and they were sure she's not going to go, but she ended up going. She said, Elech, one Hebrew word, one word. Stop talking and start doing. We have to check each other walk. Does it fit the light, the quality of the light that need to light the house? 
We don't want to be like those foolish virgins, brothers and sisters. We don't want to be like these foolish virgins. And the way we do it is we take upon ourselves the yoke and the burden of the Torah, not for the salvation, but rather to light the house of the king. Who is Yeshua? And lastly, we check in our own aroma. How welcoming we are, how inviting we are. I tell you one of the things that we have to be removed, spiritual judgment, yes. condemnation. Oh, this is the, the core that stop the shemen lemao, the light that the, the oil that will light the house. And lastly, you know, in Hanukkah, seven days. It took us seven days to get a flask of oil back up to Jerusalem. Are you kidding me? Jerusalem is surrounded by oil. You see, what they had to do is to take the batch of olives, press them, take one drop, and put it into, then do another batch, one drop, and put it into it, and another one, and another one, until they have one flask. That takes seven days to do it, brothers and sisters. If the first fruit is holy, if the first fruit is holy, so will be the entire batch. Romans 11, 16. If you want to do it, check today. The little God is giving you. The little mitzvah. Fulfill it. And I like the way my colleague Rabbi Bernstein said, you fulfill it to the max, and then the next day you fulfill the next one to the max, and to the next one to the max. It is not, it's, not, it's not something you have to take too much upon yourself at once. Like it says, too much honey, and you vomit on it. If we do those things today, surely the house of the Lord will be built. Isn't the master of the universe worthy of having a house lit for his name? Isn't he worthy of that today? Is he worthy of, worthy of your pride being set aside? Is he worthy of your ego being set aside? He is worthy of your vision of the house set aside? Is he worthy of those things? That's what it boils down to. So can you play a don't know for me? You, you, you don't have the cord? Can you not pull them in the phone quickly for me? <coughs> okay, cut off. I'm just going to pray then. Thank you, Lord. Who wants to be this Shemin Lemao? Who wants to be today? Can I see a hand? Who wants to be Shemin Lemao? Shemin Lemao. I want to pray for you. <laughs> and isn't it interesting? We are going to conclude in a second with the Avdala, and this is exactly what the Avdala is Shemin Lemao. So no, he will set, help him set himself up. I'm just praying right now, Holy Spirit, each and every one of you. Now well, let's just stand up, let's just stand up, let's just pray, let's intercede. We've come today, we come for you, Lord, and we say these words, those two things, Shem and Lema'o, this is the missing ingredients. Lord, we can put all the work, all the work, but if there is not oil, and if there are no spices, the stinkiness, be, stay, and we say, be gone. Be gone from our synagogues. Be gone from our families and be gone from every relationship. Every relationship that produce unholy aroma. Lord, we are just asking right now upon those places for the Mashiach, the Shemin, the, the, spy, the, the, the Messiah will come to those places right now. We're just believing for us. And we're coming right now against, against any of those five things. Lord, we are just speaking specifically right now for those five things. I'm speaking against any unpleasant fragrance spiritually in our life. Anything that cause us to smell bad and the construction to be crooked. Lord, we come against it. The debris, I pray I have a word. Those who are debris will be resurrected. There is no dead debris in the house of the king. Those who are really need to be resurrected today, Lord. Resurrect them today that they know that they have a purpose. They have a purpose in building the house of the king. Number two, in the name above all name, I pray right now for the smell of each and every one of us who build the house, especially leaders. Lord, I pray that you raise leaders to a higher standard, higher standard upon our leaders, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Actually, I want to pray specifically for Brandon Stacy to the come, come. I want to pray this, this is your, I want to pray for the leaders. This is what we need to come, come. I want just let us extend the hand. Come, come around, come around, guys. You're gonna help help Noah here with the line a second. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray for the leaders upon the community, Lord, today. To walk even in a higher standard in the name of Yeshua, holding one another accountable. And holding the community accountable and community holding them accountable. Yes, Lord. This is what you call the leaders. They are lighting out of where everybody else is like the shamash, the servants, Lord. We are praying for them. That they will be beyond any reproach, anything that, that can come against them, Lord. We just cast it in the name of Yeshua right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Abba, right now, Holy Spirit. We're praying for this right now in this place right now. For the shaman to shaman to protect them. To protect them. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just remain standing for one more second. Everybody, we're releasing this right now, Lord. Abundance, abundance of mitzvot. Abundance of loving, acts of loving kindness. Abundance, abundance of acts of loving kindness and mitzvot and Torah. Not for the sake of one a giving, receiving reward, but for the reward that they will receive in heaven as those actions should be to store up our treasure in heaven, not on earth. Not on earth, Lord. We're asking this right now in the name of Yeshua, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that the mitzvah is the lamp and the Torah is the light. Fill us with the lamps. Till fill us with the great light today. A quality light today. May those mitzvot will be such an act of generosity. Such an act of loving kindness. Such an act of humility. Such an act of repentance. Such an act of teshuvah. This is what we need, Lord, to be able to walk. Fill us with this. Remove Remove from our life today any pride, any arrogance, anything that can come and dim the light that is going to go in the house of the king. Lord, we are coming against it, against lies, against deceptions, against angry spirit, against spirit of entitlement. Break those spirits, Lord, because we want to be these lights who come and meet Yeshua, not those who run out of oil in the name of Yeshua. And right now I come, Lord, and I say, the aroma in the house will be wonderful because the spices will signal to the Lord that the house has been built. The remnant has been building the house. And just like Rivka, our mother, who was tested, and she lit the house. I pray upon each and every one of us. God, you've given us, uh, listen to me, God have a word for me, for, for you, for, right now I hear it. He says, and for me too, God is going to give you an opportunity. He's going to bring people into your life that need the light. He's already brought, don't, don't push them off. Don't shove them away. Listen, if God ordained and sent somebody to your life today, it's not by accident. He sent them because they needed a delight. Mm -hmm. Yitzhak needed Rivka to, oh, to bring the light. Otherwise, he's as good as dead without the light of Sarah. The same to you today, Rabbi, in the name of Yeshua. You are sending, you're purifying our light so that we will bring the light to those around us who need the light. Take us and give us those opportunities with purpose, Lord, and let us not walk away from those opportunities that God is giving us because the window is, the, is near, the time is short. Lord, you're giving us those two things, Lord. And we are to take those things. And Lord, all throughout all of those things, way may the name of Yeshua will be able. I just speak this passage over us right in this morning. Psalm 132, 17, which says, that I will make a horn sprout of David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. You are this lamp. You are the preparation. I have a word for you. You are this lamp.
that is going to bring the anointed one to the world. Abba, I ask all of those things today. Abba, in the name of Yeshua, convict your people about their light and their quality of this light. There's much brighter light in you than you realize today. Don't let it dim. In the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen.